You're listening to Humans in Tech. Our podcast explores today's most transformative technology and the trends of tomorrow, bringing together the brightest minds in and outside of our industry. We unpack what's new in physical access, identity verification, cybersecurity, and IoT ecosystems. We reach beyond the physical world, discuss our digital transformation as a species, and dive into the emerging digital experience. Join us on our journey as we discover just how connected the future will be and how we will fit into that picture. Chances are you know at least one conspiracy theory surrounding Area 51. The near-mythical U.S. military research facility in the Nevada desert is protected by motion sensors, a patrol of armed guards, and a no-fly zone through the entire site. It's one of the most secure places in the world. Lee Dow, VP of Global Marketing at Identive, is here to talk with what makes Area 51 so secure. Lee and I are joined by Seth Shostak, Ph.D., Astrophysics and Senior Astronomer at SETI Institute. Seth, I cannot wait to talk to you, um, and neither can Allison. Uh, we really want to dig into Area 51. Um, you know, the CIA only acknowledged its existence in 2013, although right. its history, right, as detailed in documents released around the same time, dates to 1955. And, um, you know, the stated mission of Area 51 is to develop and test, you know, state-of-the-art aircraft technology. And I used to work at Honeywell Aerospace, so, um, you know, obviously I'm, you know, an aircraft nerd. Uh, so this makes it a target for foreign intelligence services, and security is so tight at this U.S. Air Force base. It's got a guard patrol authorized to use deadly force on trespassers, long-range motion detection to warn them of new arrivals on foot or spinning in space, and it's just such an area that's just clouded in mystery. Well, Area 51, I think that that's part of a, a more general phenomenon. Uh, obviously, there are parts of the government that you know, are secretive, particularly in defense, and, you know, more especially the development of new kinds of weapons technology. And Area 51 fits into all that. I mean, it, it was set up during the Cold War. They would fly people in and out. I think they still do that from Las Vegas. So, you know, there, there are no cars going in there and stuff like that. And it's secret. Yes, it's secret. But what I find particularly peculiar is the fact that it has become associated uh, with UFOs, UAPs, whatever you want to call them that it somehow uh, fits into that narrative. And I think that the only reason it does is because people don't, in general, know what goes on there. So as a desert dweller, <laughs> um, Allison and I are both in, in the desert. Uh, you know, we think you'd have to be living under a rock in the desert to have never heard of Area 51. I mean, it's so ingrained in Americana lore. Um, and I think the more secrecy that, sh you know, it's shrouded in, the further the imagination goes. Um, it's well known for housing some of the world's biggest secrets and cover-ups. So many conspiracy theorists. It's also famous for hiding information on aliens, like you said, and UFO sightings. And we may never know the complete story of what occurs at Area 51 because the level of security is so high. Um, and the depth of what happens on the inside remains such a mystery. Well, uh, that's certainly true. But I have to say that I grew up uh, about two miles from the Pentagon. And my father worked for the, oh, Department, wow. of De the Department of Defense. And, you know, he wanted, to go, he wanted to go over there to play handball, actually. And I would <laughs> usually come along and, you know, swim in the pool there and that sort of thing. I've been in the Pentagon, actually, many times. The uh, Pentagon has a pool? Yeah. I had no <laughs> idea. Wow. Yeah, yeah, they, they had sort of an exercise. With, you know, as I say, he was there to play handball. That was also, you know, inside the Pentagon. The Pentagon is actually a very, very big place. If you look at it from the air, you can see it was designed to have lots and lots of offices, like all of which had windows, right? So that's why it has this very, very peculiar morphology that you see in aerial photos. But I'm sure there were plenty of secret things going on in the Pentagon. Of course there were, right? Uh, military defense strategy and stuff like that. But that, that was, you know, not in the, the place where my father was, you know, practicing his handball or that I was swimming, but I, I wouldn't doubt it. I'm, I'm quite sure that there are places. I, in fact, grew up in Arlington, Virginia, as I just mentioned, and just about all my neighbors work for one uh, branch of the government or other. To, to Rose over was a, a pretty high up guy in the FBI. That was normal where I was. They were all government employees. Never 
found anything that seemed nefarious. Uh, my girlfriend's father worked with the Department of, uh, well, it was civil defense, actually, in case of a nuclear war, what happens, that kind of thing. That was normal. So I don't have this idea that anything that the government is doing is somehow nefarious. Their job was to, you know, pr protect the country, if you will. And to do that adequately, you really do have to have some defense secrets. Anybody who has uh, studied the Second World War can understand that kind of thing. If you don't have secrets, then you don't have the capability to mount a very good defense. So we know that Area 51 was built during the Cold War as a testing and development facility for aircraft, um, including the uh, U-2 and SR-71 Blackbird uh, reconnaissance planes. What is it used for today? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, it's, you know, it's an aircraft testing facility. One of the women in our book club, as a matter of fact, happened to work at Area 51. And I would occasionally ask her, so did you see any aliens or alien craft there? <laughs> and, and, and she said, no, but lots of, lots of interesting airplanes. That was her response. She was simply bemused by this extreme f fascination with the place. So how does the staff get in and out? Well, I, you know, <laughs> I have to say, I thought that the, the interview was not about Area 51. It was about ET. But uh, how the staff gets in and out, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, they're mostly flown in. That's, I think that's still the case. Well, so yeah, it's I a read, very controlling. Yeah, I read that the employees at the base uh, don't commute to the site by car. Um, right. That air traffic control audio um, that they out of a private terminal in uh, Las Vegas McCarran International Airport suggests right. that like government owned passenger jets flying under the name Janet Airlines uh, yep. make daily flights in and out to somewhere in the Nevada desert. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that that's true. That's consistent, at least with what I've heard and read myself. As I say, this, de this de developed during the Cold War. If you develop a new fighter aircraft, for example, and of course you're always doing that, right? You don't want it to be photographed or seen even uh, by potential enemies or actual enemies. I mean, that's just very straightforward. And so they do control access. And uh, I, I think that is, again, the fascination with it uh, is because it is secretive. But there are other places in the government that are secretive. Uh, and the U.S., as a matter of fact, is peculiar. I've lived in other places in the world. And only in the United States do people think that because something's secretive, that there's something nefarious going on there. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I've never understood that logic. What do you think it is? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so you're, you have a PhD in astrophysics and you're a senior astronomer at SETI Institute. Um, and of course that's the acronym for search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, so you've developed an interest in extraterrestrial life um, at the tender age of 10 um, when you first picked up a book about the solar system. Um, so that led to a degree in radio astronomy, correct? And now you're a senior astronomer? I am the senior astronomer for the SETI Institute. That is correct. Nice. Well, you know, you um, really have been very keen on outreach activities, um, especially for young people in science in general, but astrobiology in particular. Um, and you have a textbook, a college textbook on um, astrobiology. Uh, and you've also written several books for SETI. Um, and published, I think, something like 400 articles. Um, and you're a regular contributor to NBC News. Um, and you give a lot of talks annually. Uh, and you have a weekly science radio show, Big Picture Science. Um, so obviously, you're very, very knowledgeable on extraterrestrial life. Um, so with the majority of our audience coming from security background, can you tell us a little bit about your work at SETI? Yeah. We're trying to find ET. Uh, that's one of the projects at the SETI Institute. And in fact, at the beginning of the Institute, which was founded in 1984, that was the only project. It was uh, the efforts to find intelligent life elsewhere, not just life. You might find life on Mars, right? But it's going to be something you'll need a microscope to see because it's going to be like bacteria. That's still extremely interesting, just finding life. But uh, we're, we're going whole hog, if you will, in trying to find intelligent life. Anybody who's seen the movie Contact knows how it's done because that novel was written by Carl Sagan and he did a, at least one SETI experiment, but he certainly knew about the, the, uh, the way it's done. And, and the way it's done is just like in the movie Contact. Uh, we use big antennas and try and eavesdrop on ET. So um, I actually, fun fact, um, I have a child who uh, is a geologist 
And most of her undergraduate work was done on uh, what, what I like to call space rocks. Um, <laughs> and uh, she's done a lot of work on studying um, asteroids uh, and, uh, you know, particles from there. And, of course, you know, always looking at, um, you know, different, uh, not only geological, but the biology that lives in that, um, you know, that terrain. Uh, so, you know, it's definitely a topic of conversation in our house. Um, so what type of research is conducted at the in- Institute? Well, it's really astrobiology. This is a new term, which is a rather peculiar term because it, con- you know, what it, it, it combines a, a Latin word and a Greek word, but whatever. It's just a study of, you know, life, if there is life, elsewhere in the universe. That's all. I mean, could there be life on Mars? Could there be life on, there's three moons of Jupiter where there might be life, right? There are two moons of Saturn where there might be life. But again, it's very likely to be bacterial life. And, you know, maybe one should be terribly surprised by that, because even on Earth, I mean, there's been life on Earth for close to 4 billion years. And for, you know, the first 80 percent of that, maybe 90 percent of that, it was, you know, it was micro, uh, microscopic life. So, yeah, most of the people that are, you know, inhabit the cubes and offices of, uh, uh, outside of my own are studying, for example, uh, samples that, you know, we, we hope to bring back from Mars, the rover data. Uh, they're looking at exoplanets, and more than 4,000 planets that have been found outside our solar system and see if any of them have the conditions that would support life. There are about a trillion planets in the Milky Way galaxy where we live, a trillion. That's a very big number. Just in the Milky and, Way galaxy? Wow. Just in the Milky Way. And we can see several hundred billion other galaxies, each with a trillion planets. So there's a tremendous opportunity for life. And uh, the only question is, you know, how could you find it and can we find it? So is there a lot of excitement at SETI over the new telescope that's been launched? Well, the James Webb Space Telescope, indeed, is interesting. It, it wasn't built to look for life, to be right. honest. It was built to do what's called cosmology, right? The idea is to look at galaxies very, very far away, which is to say you get to see them as they were when they were very young. And the idea is to... You know, I mean, why would you study children if you were an alien that came to Earth? Well, you'd like to see how humans develop, right? How they become adults, right? <laughs> and it's the same deal. It's the same deal with James Webb, right? That's what it's trying to do. By looking very far away, you see the universe as it was very, very young, and you learn how it then got older. But from the standpoint of life in space, the James Webb telescope might be able to do a couple of things. One is it could study the atmospheres of planets, not in our solar system, but in other solar systems and see if any of them, you know, have oxygen, for example, in their atmospheres. And, you know, the oxygen in our atmospheres is due entirely to photosynthesis. So if you find it in somebody else's atmosphere, that might be very interesting in terms of looking for life. The other thing it might be able to find are really super duper civilizations, ones that are, you know, literally billions of years more advanced than we are. So that would be intelligent life able to build very, very large structures, and you might see the heat coming off of those with this telescope. So it promises to to address a lot of questions. Um, Seth, we'd love to hear more about the technology deployed at SETI. Yeah, well, uh, to to be honest, the technology is, you know, it, it, it wouldn't impress terribly many people in the physics department of any university because the ideas behind it are really quite simple. But what we use are these big antennas, right? You know, we've had big antennas, well, beginning with the Second World War, as a matter of fact. But we have our own set of antennas in Northern California. It's called the Allen Telescope Array. All right, if you saw those, you would say, well, these just look like backyard satellite dishes on steroids, Hmm. right? That's kind of what they look like. And the technology is really more in what happens after you built the antennas. You have to have a very, very sensitive amplifier. Call it a receiver at the focus, there's a lot of technology in there. That's that's basically electronics, microelectronics, microwave technology. And then after that, you go on to take all this cosmic static and spread it out into a whole range of channels, if you will, because we don't know where on the dial we might find a signal from aliens, right? They never they never sent us that email that would tell us. <laughs> so uh, you know that technology is basically using very well established mathematics. You know, just about anybody who studies electrical engineering or even mathematics uh, would know. And uh, the only question is how much compute power you have. The more compute power you have, uh, the faster you can sift through 
the static from a lot of the sky and see if you can find something. So what's the coolest thing you've ever heard? Coolest thing I've ever heard in, in regard to all this? Yeah, or just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I've heard a lot of cool things. <laughs> uh, the coolest thing I've ever heard, well, I, I think maybe it's the coolest thing I ever experienced because you hear it and it isn't all that cool. But uh, when you do it, it is. Back in, and it's been like 25 years now, uh, 25 years ago, I was called up at home by the boss of the Institute who said, you ought to get down to the office. And I did. And we had picked up a signal that looked like it might be ET, at least for mm, about half a day. Oh, wow. Right. And uh, I thought, OK, uh, you know, maybe there's a red phone here where we can call the president. <laughs> of course, there's no red phone. I thought, well, maybe the president will call us. The president will call us. Nobody called us. My mom didn't call us. <laughs> uh, but but it looked like it was a signal. This was going to change everything. Right. Uh, it took about a day before we figured out it was just interference from a satellite, a European satellite. But, uh, you know, I, I, I said, you know, nobody cares. Right. That was my impression. We don't keep any secrets there. So, you know, it's possible that a lot of people knew even before we'd ever confirmed this. And sure enough, you know, I'm ha at my desk half asleep because I've been up all night you know, looking at <laughs> computer screens. And at 930 in the morning, uh, a science reporter from the New York Times called up. I actually knew this guy. And he said, all right, Seth, what about that signal you're following? So, you know, they already knew about it, the New York Times. And, and, and 24 hours hadn't gone by. Huh. So, uh, yeah, but, but then, you know, it turned out that it wasn't anything very interesting. And the Times didn't even run a story about it. <laughs> but, you know, one of the questions I get very frequently is, if you guys found a signal, would you even tell us? Right? There, there's some sort of conspiracy mindset here. And the fact is that, you know, we, there's no policy of secrecy. The New York Times already knew about it, and it had, less than a day had gone by. And that was, it was quite interesting how quickly they, everybody knew about it. Yeah, word spreads fast, right? Well, yeah, and, and that was before social media really took off. I mean, today it would be even faster, I'm quite sure. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about your personal beliefs and findings on extraterrestrial life? Well, since we haven't found it, you can have any belief you like. Uh, there, are, <laughs> there, are people, there are people who think, you know, uh, well, you're never going to find it because the aliens don't exist. There are those with that mindset. But that would mean that in a, in a galaxy with a trillion planets, namely ours, that all those planets except Earth are sterile, right? That's possible, right? It doesn't violate physics, but it violates a common axiom of science, which is to never expect that you are somehow special, mm -hmm. right? A well, special observer. It's a bit right? of an arrogant um, opinion, I guess, right? <laughs> well, it, it, yeah, that's sort of a moral call, is it arrogant? <laughs> but, but, it's, but it's also based on experience, right? For most of uh, you, you know, the history of humanity, we thought we were special. Uh, up until the time of Copernicus, we thought we were in the center of, uh, of the universe, and we thought all the planets revolved around the Earth, well, that turned out not be, to be true. Then we figured, okay, the sun, they revolve, but the sun is the center of everything. And that turned out not to be true. And then up until 1920, thereabouts, we thought, you know, the Milky Way galaxy was the only galaxy. And it turns out that's not true. And today we talk about the fact that, you know, it's very likely that there are other universes, entire universes that are different. So, you know, they say, oh, we're the only planet with life. It, it smacks of this kind of ecocentric interpretation of where you are in the universe. For sure. So, you know, when, when people talk about UFOs, um, you know, do you have um, an opinion on, you know, stories about actual sightings of UFOs? Um, and UFOs, right, have become uh, a phrase or a term now that even the Air Force has admitted, yeah, sometimes we see stuff that we don't know what it is. That doesn't mean it's yeah. extraterrestrial life. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of concur with that. I, I tend to be a skeptic, which makes me unpopular uh, on uh, ancient aliens and stuff like that. But, you know, I just don't see any evidence. I mean, the usual claim in the past was, look, these things have been seen by, you know, commercial pilots, uh, military pilots. They've been seen by lots of people. They're on the order of 8,000 these days. The number seems to have gone down a little bit, but roughly 8,000 people a year in the United States alone, right, report these sightings. There's a guy up in the Seattle area who compiles these reports. Nice guy. Uh, but 
you know, so roughly, say, 10,000 people a year will report seeing a UFO. And I'm sure many, many more people don't go to the trouble of reporting it. But I think that if we were really being visited, which is the contention made by these people, uh, we would know about that. It, it, you know, because you would see them. It, it's like asking the uh, Narragansett Indians of, of Massachusetts back in the 1600s, hey, do you think you're being visited by Europeans? <laughs> yeah, that's no, a good analogy. <laughs> yeah, but I said there was no doubt in their mind. They say, yeah, they're right down the road here. You can see them trying to plant something so they have something to eat. I mean, there was absolutely no, you know, it wasn't that the chiefs of the, of the tribe were hiding that information. To begin with, they couldn't hide it. And the other thing is they didn't see any reason to hide it. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of the same situation today. Many people seem to believe that the military has the capability of, you know, keeping all this stuff secret. Whereas if they were really being visited, you know, the FAA wouldn't let commercial air flights leave your local airport because if they don't know what's up in the sky, they're not going to let you fly. Well, I mean, and why would they all just go right to Area 51? <laughs> well, well, that's another phenomenon. Yeah, they all go to Area 51. <laughs> it used to be that there was also uh, there's a base. What is it? Uh, Hangar 39 or whatever it was, was always said to be the place where they, you know, stored alien craft. But that's actually uh, in Ohio somewhere. But Ohio is not as glamorous as Area 51. (laughs) So, you know, you mentioned uh, a man in Seattle, but I'm sure that there are lots of people, you know, all over the world who have, you know, interest in extraterrestrial life. And how did they tap into SETI and some of the other avenues um, of your work? You know, whether it's big picture science or other ways to communicate that. Well, I don't know to what extent they're actually (laughs) tapped into any of that. But keep in mind that science is an international endeavor, right? I mean, you know, there are almost no secrets kept in science between one place and another. I mean, if you're a pharmaceutical company, and you're developing, you know, some sort of new new medication of some sort, you might try and keep that secret from your competitors. That 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 might happen. But in general, basic research is completely open to all the journals. Anybody can subscribe to the journals. You read about things. We used to have uh, conferences with the USSR back in the days when there was a USSR. And it was kind of a good thing because then, you know, you actually bring people from different countries together. And they're less likely to drop bombs on one another. That was always my impression. But in any case, whatever, there's essentially no secrecy in science. SETI, however, is these days done only in the United States. It's not being done by any other countries. And that's a somewhat dismaying situation because there were a lot more uh, countries that did it in the past. Nice. So um, besides big picture science, um, you know, what, where else can we follow your work? Well, I mean, you always can go to the SETI Institute website, which is just SETI.org. It's simple enough. It's a nonprofit. Um, the, uh, for the rest, I do, I do write a lot of articles that are published by well, NBC and, and others, actually. So there's that. I have some books and all that. But people, people can find me very easily. Just go to Google and you can find me. <laughs> the fire up the Google machine. <laughs> yep. Yep. You can. Well, Google's headquarters is... Also, just down the street here, I'm in the Silicon Valley. Oh, nice. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, very interesting topic. Uh, and we will definitely, you know, be following and we're fans of your work. So for sure. Appreciate it. <laughs> OK. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Seth. Physical security, identity verification, the IOT. The hyperconnectivity of our lives will only grow more pervasive. As technology becomes more automated and experiences more augmented, it's up to us to preserve our humanity and use new tools and trends for good. The only question is, are we up for the challenge?